Welcome. My name is Grace Shemaine, and I'm the president of the League of Women Voters of Texas. The League is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. We never support or oppose political parties or political candidates. Our mission is empowering voters and defending democracy. We know that this is a critical election and normal election processes are likely to, to be disrupted by the pandemic. This includes the recruiting, hiring, training, and attendance of every kind of election worker. The League gathered panelists for this webinar who have expertise to share in election worker recruitment. Our hope is that the webinar participants will act on the suggestions and ideas we hear today. All of us must pull together to offer voters in Texas the best, most safe election experience that is possible under the circumstances. Our audience today includes county election officials, league members, and nonprofit organization leaders from across the state. We will begin with the League of Women Voters of Texas Voting and Elections Issue Chair, Cindy Weatherby, who will be asking questions to the panelists. We encourage participants to submit questions too by using the Q and A buttons on your screens. Because we will we expect there will be lots of questions. We suggest you type yours in as soon as you think of it. Board member Dorothy Marchand will be monitoring questions throughout this session and sorting them by common topics. Please limit questions to those that are helpful to everyone. Karen Kelly is gonna give a quick overview of Zoom functions for those who need a little help. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you, Grace. Welcome everyone and thank you again for joining us today. Uh, I'd like to just review the tools that we'll use at today's webinar. It looks different for different devices, so please take this time to become familiar on your device. Attendees are muted throughout the event with no video and will participate with the nonverbal Zoom tools uh, that we'll have today. So uh, you will see a speaker view on your end, um, which will give you a video of the speaker if they have that turned on. Otherwise, um, you may see a screen share. On your Zoom screen, generally at the bottom, there are small icons for chat and Q&A, so take a moment to locate those. If you are dialed in by phone, but not also joined by a computer, a smartphone, or a tablet, you will not see those icons, of course. In chat, we'll use the chat for comments and questions, which are not necessarily meant for the speakers, like, hi, everyone, or I can't find that Q&A icon. <laughs> Anyone will be able to comment back if you send to all panelists and attendees. You can also use chat for technical issues, and we will do our best to address in a timely manner. The Q&A icon um, and Q&A box will be uh, moderated by Dorothy Marshawn, as Grace mentioned, and we'll, she will read your questions and comments to the speaker when it's appropriate. The Q&A box has two views, um, all questions and my questions. Please select all questions for today. There are tabs at the top of the Q&A box, the first one for questions, and as they are answered or dismissed, they move to the appropriate tab. You might want to write down your comments or questions also to make it easier to type in uh, when you're ready. You'll also note there is a like icon, so you can upvote a question for the moderator, and you can also make comments under a question um, to add to that for the moderator. We'll also use polling a few times in this webinar. There is no icon for polls. It will be a pop-up on your system. Thank you, Grace. Back to you. Thank you, Karen. Karen. If you're having any te technical difficulties, then please use the chat function and we will do our best to address them. Our State League Executive Administrator Eileen McMurray will be monitoring the chat entries and our in-house Kelly uh, will assist you with any tech issues. You may also use chat for general communications among participants, but we ask that all comments show utmost respect to all panelists and participants. We also ask that any partisan remarks refer only to election worker recruitment. No campaigning, please. We are attempting to get a good recording of the webinar and hope to post and share it. Before we begin, let's do a quick poll for all our participants and other panel, and other than the panelists. And uh, uh, please enter your answer to the poll that should pop up on your screen right now, which is, go ahead, Karen, if you could put the first poll up. It 
So if you will, you just have a few, uh, I'll give you a five seconds, 10 seconds to complete this, then hit submit and we'll see who's here today. Okay, Karen. Let's get the results. There you go. Some election staff, some uh, partisan organizations, some nonpartisan organizations, nonpartisan organization volunteers, and some others. So we welcome everybody. Thank you so much for, for participating. I'm gonna close that down for me. Um, let's see. So Cindy, I'd like to introduce Cindy Weatherby now. Cindy, we wanna go ahead and get us started. Thanks, Grace. Well, you know, we really want to thank our expert panel that's here today, and they're going to share challenges that they're all facing and offer us advice on how we, we may be able to assist. And we really, really appreciate them taking time out to talk with us because not only are they addressing their county's respective needs, but uh, Yvonne, Chris, and Heather are also serving in leadership roles for their statewide professional organizations. Uh, first, want to introduce Yvonne Ramon, who's the president of the Texas Association of Elections Administrators and the elections administrator for Hidalgo County. Uh, that's the county where the county seat is Edinburgh and the largest city is McAllen. Christopher Davis, who's the immediate past president of that same association and the current legislative chair for the group. And Chris is the Williamson County EA. Uh, Georgetown is their county seat, and there are several other very fast-growing cities, including Round Rock, Cedar Park, and Hutto. And Heather Hawthorne, who is with the Texas County and District Clerks Association and serves as their legislative committee chair. Heather is the county clerk in Chambers County. Anahuac is the county seat, but among other towns are Baytown and Winnie. And we've also got with us today Kay Proud, who is Williamson County's polling place and recruiting coordinator that Chris suggested join us today. And I'm sure she has some real day-to-day -day, uh, suggestions and observations that she can give us. These questions that we're gonna talk about today relate directly to the July 14th, 2020 primary runoff election. And there are some also some localized special elections. We want to wait to talk about the November election because who knows what gonna, what's gonna change between now and then, but throughout, if panelists have comments to make about November, please do include them. I'm gonna ask the three uh, association leaders to give us no more than a five minute overview of their preparations for the July 14th election and I'll alternate the order in which I call upon you so no one has to go first every time. Um, so can you tell us what your biggest challenges are and what has stayed the same, anything, and what has changed? And I'll start with Yvonne, please. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you for asking me to be a part of this. I'm, I'm very happy to be here and it's an honor. So preparations for this July 14th primary runoff are completely different for us this year. The runoff is always scheduled in May and it's right after our May local election. So our poll workers are in full swing. They're very current with all election processes and they're up to date on any changes, but that didn't occur this year, as we well know. We'll have to bring in our poll workers to train on something very, very different this time around, and that's how to be safe, how to maintain a safe environment, and how to utilize this training in keeping our voters safe as well. So what is our main goal? Our main goal here in Hidalgo County is to communicate to our community of voters that they will be in a safe environment when they go vote. Accomplishing this goal has been challenging in many respects because we've all had to become expert in uh, not just what personal protective equipment or PPEs are, but also how and what is needed to accomplish this goal of safety. Our training is now going to include modules on how to use PPEs, on how to discard the personal protective equipment. And so we've been watching videos, we've been selecting those that will help us train for this very, very important part of what is now very new to the election polling site. Thank you. 
Thanks, Yvonne. Chris, would you like to add any of your observations too? Thank you, Cindy, and the league for uh, having us, uh, myself, my polling place coordinator here. Um, I want to thank you for getting the governor to wait until yesterday to announce his extension of early voting for November, too. I'm sure that was coordinated and ties in quite well with today's hearing. So good job on that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Yvonne really said a lot and said it all as far as, as, as what our prep is. One of our biggest challenges right now, to answer one of your questions, is just the adapting. Adapting to everyday changes, uh, adapting to whatever uh, the latest decision is and it's these essential ping pong matches of court case decisions that I'm sure all of us have been monitoring, adapting to the changes, the fundamental changes in, in election dates that we've had. Very little has stayed the same, for, probably for any of our lives, both mm -hmm. uh, at home and at work these last two, three months. We anticipate some things. The familiar will start to kick in and early voting begins and, and, and in, in some ways ballot by mail voting those things that all of us have trained so hard and long for, it's going to be nice to get back to that kind of familiar rhythm of actually running election, even though this one will be fundamentally different than anyone we've ever run in the past. Thanks, Chris. Heather, would you like to add some things? Hey, everyone. I hope you're enjoying your lunch. What a great way to have a lunch hour. Um, <laughs> So I would only like to add that, you know, because the situation is so fluid at this point, that uh, I want to make sure that everybody on this call understands that uh, we have, as an association, uh, elections administrators and county clerks across the state are in great communication with each other, trying to help each other a statewide message out about how the July 14th election will look. Uh, everything's changed, but everything's the same. We're going to have the same equipment. We're going to have all the uh, sanitizing things that everybody is now used to in the polling locations. So the facts that um, by law, you have to have an ID, et cetera. All of those things are the same, which will help the voter feel familiar when they enter the polling place. The only thing different is going to be the health measures. And that's kind of the message we want to get out. Thank you. Well, I know one thing has not changed, and that's the commitment of you three to make sure that there is a safe and secure election. Uh, we're next gonna do a really quick poll to see uh, a little bit about what your experiences have been regarding election workers. So Karen, would you put up our next poll, please? Our next and last, I believe. And if you could quickly move through this so that we can move forward, our time is so limited. And Karen, let us know when you think it's the time for you to report in. Three more seconds. Well, that's a lot more uh, equal than I had expected, actually. So it looks like we do have a good number of people who have worked as election workers. But of course you see there's uh, almost uh, a little over a half that haven't. I'm really glad that all of you are on board. Uh, and are you already recruiting for the election? That's marvelous to see and exciting to see that those who aren't are planning to, and it sounds like we've got a great receptive community that's on this call to uh, move forward with some great information we're gonna get today. Thank you very much. So let's move on to the more detailed questions. And we'll start with Yvonne, then go to Heather and then Chris. Please tell us a little bit more in detail about the specific worker skill sets and the tasks that you're recruiting for this July election. And also address the relationship with the political parties and the breakdown of responsibilities. So if you could start, Yvonne. 
Yes, thank you. We definitely hire a varied group of poll workers at each site. We honor those poll workers. I have workers that have been doing this duty for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're getting up there in age, but you know what? We need that smile. We need that greeting that is also a very necessary part of poll location, so we honor them. I'm always recruiting poll workers. I don't care if I'm at the grocery store or where I am. I'm always talking about, are you interested in becoming a poll worker? But I have had a few plans uh, that I have set in motion. Uh, I'm trying to be proactive. For example, I am an educator at heart, and that is my career choice uh, before coming to elections. And so I work with retired uh, educators. I, I love to have people that are retired that have been in the workforce and then come uh, when they're tired of, of, of not doing much of anything, then they come and help us. I'm back on. So we get them trained, and once they are trained, they stay with us. I'm also trying to reach out to other retired communities. For example, before this law in um, uh, mobile voting changed, I was working with veterans. I was trying to get a group of veterans to go to the different associations like the VFWs, the American Legions, and have veterans assisting veterans. But now I have to reassess my plan since mobile voting has changed for us. The law no longer allows to be uh, mobile voting. It has to be on for the entire period. And, and so that's not working for me anymore. But it's very important that we I, I think I keep, uh, am I back on? Yes. Can somebody tell me. Okay. So I'm, I'm trying my best to be proactive. We do have, um, when people are interested in being poll workers, they call in and we have a base that we going. But in trying to have the community reach out to us, I, as I'm trying to say, I keep uh, coming off the, the Zoom. I'm also trying to be proactive and reaching out. So uh, another a question that you have is working with the political parties. We really, really need them to be uh, strong and open-minded. I, I don't like to hear statements when we're trying to get uh, poll workers to come and, and train for them to say, oh, I've been a poll watcher. I don't really need to be trained because it's very important that they know that the training that we get is to make sure that that poll location smoothly, that that poll location worker knows the documents that are very necessary in order for this work. So one statement that my poll workers always hear is that our duty is to make sure that a person who is supposed to vote votes positive and very welcoming environment. Thank you. Thanks, Yvonne. Heather, would you like to add anything? I would. It's so very challenging right now because of trying to keep in mind the safety of our older, um, our older Texans and also knowing that they're the ones that have all the experience. Uh, so that has been a big challenge for most of us in the elections world especially with the July um, election because it's coming so quickly and then the extension of the early voting days and hours. So it is, we're trying to be very um, mindful that we hate to ask a poll worker, even though they are the greatest thing ever, um, that's past 70, 75 years old to come and, and risk their own personal safety in the name of democracy. Um, the other, and, and, and Yvonne's right, there are so many groups that we've started now reaching out to, the retired teachers, the veterans, et cetera. Um, I think the um, one thing that I'm experiencing is that I'm taking advantage of our our election judges and alternate judges and clerks that normally work the November election, using them in July to um, kind of retrain, to kind of have a dry run for the November election. Uh, I, it, we're just using it as a great opportunity to make sure that those folks feel very confident the minute the doors open. But it, um, I have a training session that I call the boot camp, and I require everybody to attend boot camp. And it's about three and a half hours long. 
um, and we cover, we try to cover A to Z during that boot camp. And so I will miss my older, uh, more seasoned poll workers for July. And we're hoping that by the pandemic or as this thing plays out, I will have them for November and we'll miss them. But I'm looking at this as an opportunity to engage younger poll workers that we're gonna need for the next 25 years. Thanks, Heather. Uh, Chris. Cindy, I'm wondering if it'd be okay if I could defer on some of this to Kay Proud, my polling place coordinator, because when we talk about skill sets and attributes, other than an open mind, uh, personal stamina, and the patience of Job, I think Kay Proud can really talk about uh, the, the attributes and skill sets we're looking for and the sources of poll workers that we've been fortunate enough to draw from uh, in elections up to now, if that's okay. okay. Sure. Kay, can you unmute yourself? Sure. So we're I, from Mark primary. I'm looking to asking who would be available to work for the runoff. It started there. Then when they changed the runoff, I reached out again, and people were still responding, saying that's fine, we're good. Williamson County, the only runoff we have is on on the Democrat Party side. So I just need one side of workers to be willing to come back and work. I've had a little bit of difficulty. Um, I've sent out the information and some folks who had said yes, they were willing to work have now responded and said, you know, um, with everything that's still going on, I'm just not comfortable. I'm going to pass on this one. I'll talk to you in October. So it's been a little bit difficult. Um, I'm working with you know, waiting to get emails back from people responding. We're going to do some type of training. Our training team is going to see maybe about doing a virtual training so that we don't have to bring people into the office space to try and, and you know keep them socially distanced apart and have room for that. In the meantime, our office space is being remodeled. So we are in using only half of what we should have capable. So it's we're really shrunk down with that. But Working on it, getting some answers. And in Williamson County, we also have Sun City, which is a huge senior retirement community. And I've had people respond and say that they are willing to work and they will, they will come back and they will do that. So that's been really good on that part. I'm also gonna try and reach out to some of the kids that have worked in the primary and, and see if we can bring them on board too. We're, if I can add real quickly, we're faced with the conundrum of, and I'm sure you all are aware, the, the most common um, demographic for poll workers is a set of folks that are in, you know, the retirement age or an older, and unfortunately with this pandemic, they're also the most susceptible to it. So there's this tension there between the two, right? They're the most reliable and, con and, 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 and uh, most available as far as a pool of poll workers, but they're also a, a group and a demographic that we have to really be concerned about and look out for if they are working in, in elections at this point in time. So uh, before we move to the next question, one thing that the League of Women Voters is particularly interested in is which poll, position, poll worker positions the parties determine and provide and which you respond to. And I understand that there is a variety of relationships from county to county. Can you expand on that a little bit? Um, Heather, do you want to start with that? Sorry, I've got to get used to this unmute, mute. No. Um, absolutely. And so by statute, there's different qualifications, different um, areas where it depends on what party will be the election judge and the alternate judge and how the party comes and um, gives the elections administrators the lists that they provide us each year, et cetera, on how that is all determined. And then there are some elections where, or in all elections in our, in our neck of the woods, the early voting clerk is the one that determines the early voting judges and poll workers. So it, um, 
the relationships I think varies from county to county, depending on the demographics of the county, depending on how active those party chairs and those parties really are to get those lists and have them done in a timely manner and have them um, not only it's it's interesting they may submit a they may submit a name so I'll submit Cindy Weatherby's name and they may not have even contacted Cindy Weatherby and then when I follow up they're like I don't want to work a poll or I'm not supposed to be an election judge so there are times when it's very challenging um, working with the parties and getting that information and and it's it's very different for Yvonne in Hildago County than it is for Heather in Chambers County on working with both, both parties and getting those names submitted on time. Yvonne, do you wanna respond? We, we need to move on, but I do wanna make sure that the people who are on this webinar know who to get names to or uh, who to contact. Maybe, a, maybe the answer is contact your county election director uh, to determine what their well, needs are. What I'd like to add uh, onto what Heather said is that the the earlier that they that the parties can get us those names, the better it is for us. Because as Heather stated, sometimes we'll call on them and they don't even know what we're talking about. They have not been uh, contacted, and that's very difficult for us. So the sooner the party chairs can get us their lists, the sooner we can then draw up these teams and get them all uh, uh, situated and trained. And that'll be better for everyone. You know, it's a year long thing, as I stated already. It's not something we should start working on because an election is upon us. It's something we should always work on, always, always getting those names on the list and communicating with them so that it works out for both sides. Chris, do you, you. do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think they, you know, not a whole lot. Uh, they both covered it really well. It's, it's, okay. this, 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 it's the struggle to, to, to find workers. It's always been a challenge. Uh, it's, it's only enhanced now. And we're trying to look for any kind of opportunity that avails itself. So our next question was what the time frame is for acquiring these workers. And I'm assuming that all of you are already deep into trying to do that. But are there some significant deadlines that we should know about going into the July election? to give us some sense of urgency here? I think we lost Yvonne for momentarily. Uh, Heather, do you wanna reply to that? Chris, are you the only one still with us here? Uh, I'm here. Okay. Um, or I'm here you wanna to point to Kate to do that? Pardon? I didn't hear Chris because I, I was off for a moment. Okay. We were looking for what your significant deadlines are for having people in place for the election. Well, ideally, we want to have them. We want to get training. I mean, we want them to go through a boot camp like Heather has or, or the mm -hmm. robust training that Yvonne has. We've been uh known to grab folks i mean walking by outside of a training and say hey what are you doing for the next you know couple of weeks or for election day and grab folks in right before training ideally having folks committed in time for training is always best now when it comes to clerks uh there are occasions where we can get clerks just get them into a polling place and they kind of learn at, uh, on the job training from and we try to pair them with our gold star or experienced judges um, and on alternate judges, but uh, deadlines are, I mean, we need folks and we try to fill in gaps and there's always emergency procedures. Where we're filling folks in day before an election or day before early voting begins. Uh, you've read the stories in the articles. Travis County had an issue for the primaries where they had several sites right at the onset of this pandemic uh, where judges, the folks that were opening and running the site were just abandoned their posts and they had to scramble. Right. And luckily, uh, Dana and the county clerk and Travis had kind of a pool of county workers at the ready uh, to use. That's something that we're going to try and focus on both for the primary and for the November, November election too is have a ready set of folks to fill in when 
these vacancies occur at the last moment. So uh, I'll post this to Yvonne and Heather. I think we've lost for a moment. Um, do you have uh, a way to train those last minute workers? Uh, what's your contingency plan for that? Yes, we, we definitely uh, do, as, as uh, Chris just described, there are times, even before the pandemic, we uh, had an experience once for that morning, that Tuesday morning, someone knocked on our door early and left the bin of supplies and said, I'm not going to do this. And so, like Chris, we try to have uh, experienced and trained uh, uh, people on the sidelines that can jump in and help us, my own staff. I will be left with a skeletal crew sometimes where I know they know that if they need to go off and uh, open up a site and, and, and get it going, they will until we're able to find workers. Our best scenario is to have those inexperienced, those that have not worked with us, work under an experienced judge. They, um, you know, the, the best uh, way to do this is to work a couple of elections and be there to ask questions and, and do a hands-on because just like Heather and, and Chris, we do have, we have a five hour training that we call our newbies uh, have to participate in. But even then, it's so much information that until they are at the actual poll site, will they really understand what it is they need to do. The laws that guide us, that bind us are so strict. And so there is no doubt that there is such a responsibility in reporting and, and uh, submitting of, of all the documents, uh, very, very important. So definitely, we can have an ideal situation when, when we have our team set up, but the reality is that right before, we do have to scramble and we do have to look out for those that maybe have never worked before and are, are saving us by at least joining a team and helping out. So without your Gold Star election workers, who can you rely upon now? Can you put them in contact with one another outside of that polling place or? Do you mean like uh, after the poll uh, location is set up or? Can you no, I mean the in the training when you have people coming in last minute. Mm -hmm. We do bring them into the office and we do a one-on-one. -on -one. We are working right now on trying to get a video training module that we've been working with a vendor because this would be perfect for these uh, especially now where where you know the pandemic could could take us uh, and and something without control maybe maybe a poll worker has been uh, uh, possibly uh, uh, you know infected what will we do does the whole poll location need to shut down so we are working on trying to get a video so that we can train quickly other than that right now what we do is we bring them into the office we do a one-on-one -on -one. We have a bin and supplies and everything ready to go, but that's certainly not ideal. But if it needs to go in that direction, we'll do whatever it takes. I'll send my own staff out to the poll location to train while they're on the job and be there, you know, as long as they need to be there. So we do whatever it takes, but um, hopefully the best uh, situation is to get a good pool of workers that are ready and uh, willing and trained, ready to go. That's ideal though. Thank you. Uh, one, one other question I want to follow up uh, there with it, are what positions are the hardest to recruit and which ones are new to this election that you've never had before? Supply delivery or um, call centers or, you know, dealing with the increase in vote by mail. Chris? Well, um, you know, some of our roving, they're kind of a, we call them field technicians which in a way those can uh, serve as poll workers in case of vacancies, but there are roving uh, eyes and ears during early voting or election day, and they're assigned a specific region of polling places or vote centers. That can be a challenge to fill those out because we really rely on years worth of experience for these folks, things, uh, individuals that have seen it all and know how to assess an issue because y'all are aware of how many moving parts there are at a polling place, let alone an election entirely. Uh, and they can assess an issue and, and fix it right away and keep that flow of voters going. So that, that uh, can be a challenge uh, finding those individuals, but we try our best to, you know, 
to, to keep those individuals and, and that pool of field technician stock. Mm -hmm. uh, Yvonne, did you have something to add? Yes, we also have uh, field technicians that are that go out to the poll locations. But what I was able to use during the primary is a, an incredible group of, of uh, uh, two permanent employees and four temps that are called election surveyors. They actually help us with the ADA compliance at each of our poll locations. They work with our judges and clerks and make sure that the site is ADA compliant. And if it's not, then they uh, put temporary measures in place, whatever it takes. And so this primary, we were able to use them because they know the poll location so well to actually go to the poll sites and help out in making sure that the voters were being attended to because some of the lines at some of the poll locations were quite long. And so in having them go in and assist really, really created such a, such a great tool. But I am going to make sure that we have that extra set of five or six that are perhaps working here in the office, you know, helping out uh, at the call center, but are ready to go at a moment's notice. I think this has now become a critical uh, need where we're going to have to ask our commissioner's court to allow us to perhaps hire more temporary workers to have, we're already going to hire as many as we can. Like, uh, like uh, Heather said, some of our November workers are going to come and join us in July. But besides that, we're going to hire an additional pool of temporary workers, get them trained and be ready to go as needed. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, I'm so gonna you had ask asked about, I'm sorry, you'd asked about new positions. One that came to mind, I just had to add, you know, social distance enforcement folks. Mm -hmm. That's a new role that our mm -hmm. clerks are going to have to do that they've never had before. Uh, and how we go about training, that's a new type of training. We're still developing those kind of procedures. Okay. Kay, uh, I want to ask you specifically, you're sort of where the rubber meets the road on getting these people onboarded. Um, when we first talked, you talked about the administration of how you get election workers signed up and the application process. I've had people ask, do I have to drive down to the county office to fill out a paper application? Is there, I mean, we're talking about younger people who expect younger approaches to jobs and, and uh, signing on. Um, so it would really be helpful to us, I think, to know a little bit about that process. And it may change county by county, but it's questions that our folks on this webinar can ask their county elections official. How do you handle that? And um, are there any precautions? Can, do you have, uh, have you incorporated precautions for the election workers in advance that you can tell them what they can expect? Sure. So when you're recruiting and you're talking to an individual, what are you able to tell them about that? Well, first of all, it, when a voter, when someone registers to vote in Texas, there's a, there's a line on the application that says, are you interested in being an election worker? Mm -hmm. Yes or no. When we get that application in, anyone who's processing those, they have letters ready to mail out to that voter when they check the box, yes, and, and it has several questions on it. What, what kind of position are you interested in? We need your name, your address, your email, your phone number, and there's a little description of each job, and we've even advanced it to put on like phone data, you know, phone bank, um, just data entry, just mm -hmm. so we can build, we're building a pool of workers. And then the state also requires if someone checks that box, yes, that you are supposed to send that application out to a party if they designate a party. Well, we make a list and then quarterly send them a list of either their party or if someone says, you know, doesn't check a party box, then it just goes to both parties. And they can then recruit from there. And we also recruit from there. Um, mm -hmm. in, in our office, the, the parties are very, strong in getting their judges and their alternates and and then early voting workers and then we work together with you know what crew works good together because we have crews that have always worked together and so we try to keep them if we can and add new people to get more experience so it, it's been that's been working well the only pro not problem but in, in our county uh, used to be the poll workers were just paid through payroll the, the auditors would basically just cut them a check. 
Well, then they said, we can't do that. So we had to put every, onboard everyone into payroll through the county. Well, then it became too much, so too many workers. So we, we have a payroll company that we use now. And we have taken their like 12 page application because they're a temp agency and we've made it down to about four pages, just the basics. We want to know their information. We want their name and address. We need, they need to fill out a, a W4 form. They also need to fill out the I-9 form, which means they have to either go to the office that is, is in our county of, of the temp agency and show identification for the I-9 page, or they can bring it to our office and any of, the, any of our staff right in the front are able to process that application. Or when we have face-to-face -face training classes, the temp agency sends one of their people into the office or into the classes and they can take the application there and get them processed. It's a little bit more difficult with the high school students because sometimes they don't even know what their social security number is. So it's like, oh, I gotta call my mom. I've, I've gotta get this. Right. And they can use a student ID um, as, as an identification if they don't have a driver's license. And the most common are your driver's license and social security card or your passport. So it, it's not, you know, some people are like, I don't want everybody knowing my information, but other people are like, you know what, it's fine and then they get their checks and then they get a W-2 form at the end of the year. And it, it's, we've been doing this since 2017 and it's been working quite well. Mm -hmm. So we often refer to the people who work elections as volunteers, but every volunteer is paid something. In today's economy, uh, have you found more interest in these jobs by people who are out of work and is that creating a benefit or a problem? I haven't really looked know into if brand stay. new. I haven't looked at brand new people right now, but some people are like, oh yeah, I just had to replace my air conditioner. I definitely want to work. You uh -huh. know? And, and it's, you know, it, it's not a huge dollar amount. Our, our judges are paid $12 an hour and our clerks all get 10. But, it's you know, a bit too early, I think. It's too early to say, uh, for us, at least in our county, uh, whether those folks that may be looking for work, we're seeing an influx, get back to us in a month, get back to us in three or four months to see mm -hmm. if some folks haven't quite gotten back on their feet yet, what we're going to, what we're going to see as far as November. But there's still this reticence to even, uh, this may be not the top of their list, for, uh, put it that way, when we're talking about uh, uh, an activity that that often involves a gathering of folks. Yvonne, did you want to add anything? I did. Uh, I did want to add that uh, for for those uh, poll workers that you know are we can say permanent because they help us all the time. This certainly is a help. You know, I I hear them talking all the time because we pay fourteen dollars an hour for judges and twelve dollars for clerks. So. You, you work a seven to seven by Wednesday, you're on time and a half and uh, two weeks of early vote and then election day. It, it's a it's nice uh, uh, um, where, where we do have some sort of concern is when we have a small election, uh, for example, and we can hire everyone, then some of them are upset because we didn't call on them. And, and uh, you know, we're countywide on election day, which means that poll workers are from all, can be from any area. Uh, we can vote anywhere. And so I think if there's going to be concern, if everyone wants to be hired all the time, but we can't always. We always depends on the how many we have. And, uh, but it's been, it's been a great help now that our commissioner did up the uh, to $14 and $12. It, it's a benefit. I'll be interested in seeing how pandemic and, and the loss of jobs adds to a uh, list of, of workers with something to keep an eye out on. So mm -hmm. thank you for that uh, comment because it's it's something we are watching and uh, hopefully we'll we'll be here to relieve and help some people that that do find themselves in this in this state of need. Heather, I see your face has joined us. I don't know if you've been able to listen while we've been talking or not. Uh, we were just going over the requirements for uh, the volunteers who are actually paid. Uh, for their work. And if uh, you have any 
uh, thing you want to talk about regarding the application process generally or uh, the pools being expanded by those people who may not have jobs at the moment? I'll just add it. I don't know. I'm so sorry because I, I disappeared. Um, <laughs> um, I don't know how the unemployment factor factors in if you get a temporary poll working, and I don't know if that was discussed at all, but that's one of my main concerns right now is if they're on unemployment, then they come in and work a very temporary time, how that'll affect their employment after they're hired. Exactly. I think that was why we were asking the question. <laughs> yeah, like, are we even going to be, like, they ended their unemployment with one job and now the county's going to be responsible for their unemployment from this point on because they were hired as poll workers. So we're kind of researching that as well right now. Um, and then I don't know if you talked about the pay, how varied it is amongst the counties. Um, we really did. You might talk a little bit about that. That would be helpful. So um, pay for poll workers is varied from county to county, depending on the resources. In Chambers County, we pay $14 an hour for the judge and, and an alternate judge and $12 an hour for the clerks. But I know that in, that is not true in all 254 counties. So that's an issue as well for our volunteers. I like uh -huh. <laughs> um, I know each of you, Yvonne, Heather, and Chris, uh, are in contact, as, as Yvonne started out by saying, with your peers across the state a lot. And are you aware of problems or solutions that you've heard about in that conversation that you want to address and let our participants know about today. As I said, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations on the webinar who don't know much about how to recruit and uh, how to be most helpful. And if you could tell us any unique solutions or problems that might be helpful. Chris? Yvonne? Um. Heather, do you have anything to add to that? I was. Um, I am I on? Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I do. Um, you know, myself, I'm a member of a lot of other organizations as well. And so I think that one of the greatest things maybe from this exercise today is that everybody reach out, not only to the nonprofits that you're representing on the call today, but even to extend that to um, other local nonprofits or whatever that you can get involved in or help spread the message that we are in need of poll workers statewide. It doesn't matter. Um, we are addressing some of these supply issues that um, are, are obviously, I think we've, we've, thank goodness, broken the barrier now. We're not all masks or just going to the health profession that we are now being able to get some of those PPEs and things to the election side of things, but that if everyone on this call to their elections administrator in their county and say, how can we help? We're here to help. I may not physically be able to work the poll, but let me know how I can help because I know some people who know some people who know some people. Where are your, short, where are your shortcomings? What do you need? We're mm -hmm. as, a, as a team. Um, Yvonne and Chris and I have put together a WebEx for next week for every elections administrator around the state to jump on. You know, we are all in this together. Team Text one, team everybody. I, we don't care about what party you're in. I, I don't get that pleasure. I need to represent every single human being in Chambers County. And so I want to make sure that any nonprofit out there that can lend a hand, whether it be to help park people, whether to assist in curbside voting, all of those little tiny things become huge issues when you have a lack of workers. So we, we appreciate that we've been invited to this, obviously, no doubt, but we wanna also ask that you take away from this, help us help the state of Texas, because the three of us agree that we're all one big team and one 
bad situation at one pole in one of our 254 counties is just going to make the whole state have a have a little nobody wants to be that news clip right cindy a pleasant surprise is is that we've gotten we started to see some leadership from the secretary of state's office and that they've been reaching out to a sample of counties about 20 counties and asking us to participate in a regular advisory group and they're bringing in folks or other agencies the texas department of emergency management um, the U.S. Postal Service, and soon, and this is an important one, I think, is TASB, the Texas Association of School Boards, uh -huh. is soon scheduled to talk to us. And that's going to be really interesting for a lot of our county election officers because in Yvonne and Heather, we can see the gears turning. We want to know what schools are planning for the fall. Are they right. planning to have on-campus instruction? And if so, are they still going to be able to fulfill their legally required mandate to provide us with the schools for polling places? And if they're not providing on-campus instruction, can we still use those buildings? And if they're not providing on-campus instruction and students are working from home, can we borrow their students for poll workers too? I mean, th there's uh, possible opportunities here that we're still exploring and the state, uh, you know, folks at the SOS are starting to put leadership like Yvonne and Heather in touch with, with some of these other agencies that have a 30,000 foot view of what districts are thinking about. It's still very, very early in the process. We're kind of uh, trying to work on an engine on an airplane that's just begun its flight in midair. It's, it, it, so we don't have a whole lot of answers, but uh, there's some promising. Uh, and this is sort of our maiden voyage that we should that's right. learn from sure us. Is. Well, Cindy, I know. I'd like to ask quickly, not, go ahead. We're quickly I, running I, out I, of time. I, yeah, I just wanted to add one short other thing is that. Um, that I want everyone else to know out there that one of the benefits of having this long election cycle is that um, the SOS has also gotten really involved in election security, IT security for our safe right. elections in Texas, and that we have also been able to help. And we have to remember there are some counties out there that it's a one or two man show in their office, and we need to help those people um, by putting together all of the resources that we might need in case we have not only this pandemic, but God forbid, we don't want any IT issues during the upcoming elections. And so we're all being able to help each other come up with those backup plans, all of those great tools that everyone in the state needs, but they may not have the manpower or man hours mm -hmm. able to put together. I know there's some tech groups gonna, on this webinar too that hopefully uh -huh. they can help. That's what I was going to add in, Cindy, that uh, we need to uh, really help out our small counties. Uh, you know, being from a larger, one of the larger counties, and, and I know that Heather is, and, and Chris and I are involved, and like she said, and it, we're, we're knowledgeable, we're, we're involved in hearing and training, but not everybody is. And what I have heard from our small counties is, how am I supposed to do this? I am a one man show. How can I have a backup when I don't have a backup? I'm my own backup. So if you're from a small county and you are listening, reach out to your elections administrator or your, and, and you know, ask them how you can help because they really need your help. We need your help in the large counties, but we have more resources. And I'm trying to get our small counties in touch with other small counties that do have a plan and, and do have a, a backup because as, as Heather mentioned, we're, we're trying to help each other, 254 counties coming together. And if those that are listening can reach out and help us, then thank you, we welcome it. So I've never been on anything, any panel anywhere that didn't wanna have more time for questions from the audience. <laughs> and uh, I do want to give you the opportunity to though say two things you think we could do as a support community to make your lives a little easier. Do you want to start with that, Yvonne? Definitely. The first thing I want to say is go vote. That will be <laughs> one of my two action items because, you know, we work so hard to get this ready. You can hear it in our voices. We're all so passionate about what we do and we want everybody to be as passionate. So I am committing everyone listening to commit to go vote and don't stop there. Please make sure that your family and your friends and anyone that you see at the grocery store, that you make sure that as small or as large as your primary runoff is, they go and vote. 
my second suggestion is be knowledgeable. This is what I say all the time. Do you know what's on your ballot? Do you know what races are on your ballot? Do you know if you've got both parties or uh, not on your ballot, but on, on the election runoff? Be knowledgeable. We all have our websites that have a sample ballot. And I always ask a voter, not just do I want you to go vote, but I want you to be prepared. And don't let that ballot in front of you at the polling location be the first time that you experience that sample, that ballot. Go to your sample ballot, check what's on it, you know, reflect on it, make your choice before you head out to the polls. Thanks. Thank you for Heather? that. Uh, my, I guess my two takeaways are going to be the best phone call ever would be for someone to pick up the call, phone and say, Heather, I want to help with this election instead of us trying to go out there and recruit and sell, et cetera. So that would be the best phone call ever to receive um, hearing from somebody that they are passionate about elections like obviously we are and 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 wanting to help i'm watching the q a on the side here and i'm seeing the whole who's in charge in bear county and jackie is one of our our colleagues and we just love her and so jackie is going to be so excited whoever wrote all that to get that call how can i help um and then the other thing i think is is that using july 14th as our dry run in the state of texas is if you don't have time between now and July 14th, we understand, but there's a lot of time between July 14th and November to help in that training process, to help whoever needs help get there out there and help. And of <laughs> Chris, real quickly. Yeah, I'd like to look back on the things that you guys have already done. I mean, Cindy, not a legislative committee meeting goes by where I don't see you there. And you guys are staying involved at the Capitol and the legislature. And I encourage your statewide branch and your local branches to stay involved, even if you can't make the trip to Austin. Find out who your local representatives are and call those offices and those staffers with your concerns and questions. Also, I've got to say the thing, the process, the, the process that you put in place where you're holding our feet to the fire in terms of improving our services uh, and our customer service. Those website awards program that you have has spurred on this healthy competition between counties where we're trying to get the gold star A plus year after year. I'm looking at you, Grace, and it has been awesome. And we're, we, we, you've seen market improvement on so many counties' websites because they want bragging rights. So keep up those kind of programs and the involvement with your local politicians. It does so much and it, and we, it really, really helps us. So it looks like we've got about three minutes left. Uh, I, I'm going to make an executive decision and say that we're going to be posting questions and maybe we can do some follow up, uh, maybe put together some F, uh, FAQs on our website. And I know I want to turn it back over to Grace, who's going to wrap up for us, but we are, we are a source of information always try to keep it our uh, state league website lwvtexas.org on top of your bookmark list to get questions answered about elections and we also link to the secretary of state site whenever possible so uh, dorothy my apologies we'll capture all those questions and put them on our website and we're going to have a page just on election recruitment so grace it's all yours And Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a great time. I learned so much. I'm ready to share this information. I think it's exciting and fun. And it's about democracy. It's about it's it's exactly our mission, empowering voters, defending democracy. And I know you guys love that mission statement too. Every time I say it, I just want to go empowering voters, defending democracy. Yay. So I think, and I know that, that this is Texas and this is democracy and we can do this. We can ask our friends and relatives and neighbors, are they going to be there to help their county election officials to make sure that our democracy runs smoothly, that everybody is trained and ready to go. And I'm ready to put out some promotional stuff to make sure that, uh, that you guys have the help you need and that uh, the people who have experience can provide, provide sage advice to, to the new workers and uh, that we all work together on uh, doing the best we can to having the best democracy going on during this 
horrendous pandemic uh, and hope that everybody stays safe uh, but continues to vote because voting is so incredibly important. Thank you guys for being here. Let's see if there's something else I was supposed to say. Oh, there is a survey at the end. We will look through the questions and we will put up the questions. There's a survey at the end if the participants can fill that survey out. Uh, we will also send out our new page that hopefully the election uh, officials can help us put together to make sure that we have the information that you guys need to get the help to each of the 254 counties here in Texas. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you. Thank you. Just real quickly, I understand the survey is going to be sent to you the first of next week. Oh. So it's not at the end. It's not so at the end. We want to include some resource information. Okay. That's There'll be I a have. survey coming next week with some resource information and a new page that'll be uh, ready for you guys to right. step up. And Thank you so much, all of you, for participating and all the people that have been listening. We know you could spend your lunch on other Zoom webinars somewhere else. and. We appreciate your being here. Thanks Thank you. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.